<laughs> so, John and Judy Collins. Thank you. Uh, was anyone besides these two and Judy in Mission Bay in 1974? I didn't think so. Respect your elders. We can say anything we want. <laughs> you can't tell us we're wrong. Triathlon's come a long way, and I have five minutes to try to compress 40 years into that time. In 1974, there were 46 people standing around trying to figure out how to lean a bicycle against a car without scratching one or the other. <clears throat> That wasn't a problem for me, I had a kickstand. And now, being the scholar that I am, I went to that source of all knowledge, the internet. And within the internet, I narrowed it to Wikipedia. And I have a little device here. It's gone from 46 people standing around trying to figure out where to put a bike to well over a half million people just in the USAT events alone with 150,000 members. Iron Man, we've heard a lot about Iron Man tonight. Iron Man sold out 2,500 slots in less than one minute. So triathlon has come a long way. The question is, how did it happen and why did it happen? Well, I did some further research. Um, I looked back on Wikipedia and I searched on Jackass. Jackass is an American reality series originally shown on MTV from 2000 to 2002 featuring people performing various dangerous, crude, self-injuring stunts and pranks. And to the athletes involved, triathlon was in fact a new way of looking at sport. But to the American public, it might as well have been jackass. The question of why on earth would you do that and how on earth could you do it attracted attention. And attention attracts sponsorship, it attracts media, it attracts attention. And attention is the most valuable commodity we have now. And this is not an Iron Man convention, this is USAT, however, comma. The thing that got triathlon going around the world was the media attention and catching the attention of the world as a whole. Timex could have sold a watch to every triathlete in the world for the first 10 years and not made a nickel, but it wasn't the triathletes they were selling watches to. It was Joe Sixpack who managed to figure if he could put that thing on his wrist, he might have a little bit to do with those people that were up there. Media attention is always looking for viewership. It's always looking for something to catch that attention, to get you the next assignment, to get to sell the next issue of papers. Therefore, media attention always looks for the highlights and it looks for the sound bites and it looks for the things from in which they can create an instant legend. And that's what happened. All that stuff that you've heard about the Iron Man challenge being issued. That all happened, but it wasn't really important. It didn't make any difference, but it made a wonderful story. And we, normally we get asked about 14 standard questions. And somewhere in there is, did you ever think Iron Man would become this big? Or did you ever think triathlon would become this important in the world? Or did you this, or did you that? There's 14 standard questions, and they want the 14 standard answers. Sister Madonna Booter um, apparently likes the one where we're all drunk in a bar in Honolulu <laughs> and trying to figure out who's the toughest, most macho guy up there. It wasn't true, but we have been in front of a television uh, personality who shall remain nameless, who got so tired of being told it wasn't true that it was a bunch of drunks that they turned off the cameras and went away. And this has happened over and over and over again. No one seems interested really in how it happened and why it happened and where it came from. Well, tonight, Judy is going to tell you how it happened. And they say that people who are married for a long time, and for us it's 55 years now, 
begin to know what the other person is thinking. We decided about 25 years ago that was way too scary. So we don't do that. So I don't really know what she's thinking or even what she's saying, but she's going to tell you how the Iron Man actually happened. Now, Iron Man is important, as I said, because of the media attention created triathlon. You obviously could not have an Iron Man in the Olympics. It took way too long and went on and covered way too much real estate. But the attention of Iron Man got enough people involved in triathlon and the shorter distances and TriFed and USAT and the other organizations formed and coalesced around the sport. So even though we're the originators of Iron Man, Iron Man could cease to exist today and triathlon would continue as a world, as a world movement. So that's why that's important. I kept to finish this up. They gave me, they gave us 10 minutes and we have to split it. Um, oh yeah. Uh, after this first thing in 1974, we went back to Coronado, California and managed to talk our swimming coach into putting on this, a triathlon in, in Coronado, California. And it now is the longest running triathlon in the world. Uh, been running since, uh, 1975. 1975, continuously every year, and Iron Man has been running since 78. Uh, Mission Bay has come and gone. Uh, Vine Man started somewhere around in that particular point. The point that I want to make about it is that is that the media attention was good for the sport and was good for all of us, but I don't think that it's necessarily needed now because we have a viable sport of our own. Um, would like to would like to mention that as race organizers, and we started the one in Hawaii, we started one down in Panama. We've been involved in several. That it's we understand, as I'm sure all of you know, that the real heavy lifting is done by the organizers and the volunteers and the sponsors and the people that put it on for the dilettantes who show up and go when the gun goes. And so we'd like to thank you for doing all that. And it's an honor to be recognized by the, those particular groups. And before I hand it over to Judy, the last question that we always get as we walk out the door is, what did you get out of the Iron Man? And the answer is normally, well, we got four lifetime slots at Kona, which have to be worth something. But, but now we can add to that that we got a great trip to Chicago and we met a lot of really wonderful people and met a lot of really nice old friends. So we have those memories also. And now here's Judy. <laughs> Well, each of us was going to talk for four minutes, and then for two minutes, we were going to mention something that I'm going to say in the beginning. And Kristen was going to mention this, too. It happens that her nephew-in-law is an employee of British Petroleum. And we think that's pretty wonderful to, to know that the sponsors are still willing to come forward and support athletes. Back to what the beginning of the evening started with some of the challenged athletes. And one of the great satisfactions of seeing Ironman grow to me is uh, to see the Bob Babbitts of the world, the people who have been the scribes of the sport that help us to understand how far it's come, and the Challenged Athletes Foundation, and their support of athletes with custom bodies. I think that a lot of us were born with stock bodies and life comes along and people, some people end up with custom bodies and they are now visible thanks to the Challenged Athletes Foundation and thanks to the military custom bodies the recognition of what human bodies can do, however their limbs sort out, is much more visible because everybody has huge respect for the military athlete, for all military people are athletes. 
So when they see a military athlete out there with some custom fixtures performing these same events, it opens the world to every athlete who no longer has a stock body or who never had one in the first place. Now Scholastic Sports has divisions for custom bodies. <laughs> and that warms the cockles of my heart like nothing else. Another thing, Tom Warren, I think that all of us are born, we come out of our mother's womb with a capacity for endurance which we haven't had to tap in the comfortable lives that a lot of us leave, live. When we discover sport, our bodies respond and make us feel so good that the sport becomes a lifelong habit. Tom Warren was one of the few of us who is a self-starter. He did this all the time at the sport of triathlon or not. John and I were the social sort. We are ones who ran with the herd. And when we joined a swim team or a running group or entered an event, we did our best times when, when lifted by the energy of the group. And we're still that way. The two of us don't get out on our own, but we'll show up for a hash house harriers or the swim meet and surprise ourselves. The magic of triathlon is not only that it brings back the pleasures of the childhood that Tom Warren describes, biking to the beach, running to school, but it, it reminds me that as adults, we can have those joys of childhood again. And there are three entries to hook us. If you like to bike, if you like to be in the water, or if you like to run, the door opens and pretty soon you find, as I did, that it's a whole lot more fun to spend an hour biking, running, and swimming than it is to go and work a swim workout for an hour. That's what happened when we showed up at the Mission Bay Triathlon. We skipped swim practice that night, and all of a sudden, after a little over an hour, it was done, and we felt wonderful. I never forgot it. When later we moved out to Hawaii in the next year, I kept mapping out triathlon courses from the time we landed on the island. I still do it. I do it in Chicago. And in fact, we did Chicago in 98 with the Mrs. T triathlon here. Swam in the lake and had the pleasure of biking on Lakeshore Drive. It's a great place to do a triathlon. When we were in Hawaii, we were having uh, island shock. We'd come from the mainland. If you wanted to do something fun, you could just drive 50 miles and someone would be putting on an event. Not so in Honolulu. You were it. Dave Orlowski's here. He knows what I'm talking about. If you wanted to be in a run or a swim, you also had to help put it on. You had to volunteer at the beginning or the end. You might have to be the referee in the event that you were taking part. You could see fins on a swimmer and then get right out and check him off and DQ him. Um, you, you swam in a swim meet in a, in a pool event, and when you got out, they handed you a watch to time the next event. We were such dilettantes that we thought that was an imposition. But pretty soon we found out if you wanted to have a full run and swim calendar, you had to do your part. And it was made very clear to us. When you're in Hawaii, you take charge of some of these events on the calendar. We still weren't ready to step to the plate, so they assigned us an event. We were members of the Waikiki Swim Club and the Mid-Pacific Roadrunners Club. And we were told that because of our dual membership, we would be chairman of the annual Run Swim. This was a little over two miles of running and 500 yards of swimming at Ala Moana Lagoon, where that 1980 uh, Ironman swim was held. 
The only times that counted were the first 10 finishers. And depending on who were declared themselves as runners or swimmers, they gave out a trophy. No, no prizes. You got your time. The trophy was a life ring with a running shoe in it. And they presented that to John and Judy when they declared that we were chairman of the 1977 Run Swim. It was hanging over our fireplace on Valentine's Day. And on Valentine's Day, John and I were representing our running relay teams at the awards banquet at the Primo Brewery Garden. And Madonna, that's where that started. And they were, they were about as drunk that night as this crowd is. It was an awards banquet, for heaven's sakes. And <clears throat> I looked down at the announcement that they put ahead of us on the table, you know, a piece of paper in front of your uh, chair. And it said, two weeks, run, swim. And I thought, oh boy, I hope we don't have to be in charge of that next year. And the only way out was to put on a demonstration event. And we swimmers who ran and the, the runners who swam all took part in the Honolulu Marathon each year and the Waikiki Rough Water Swim. We were veterans. There were probably 40 to 60 of us who did both of those events. And we always were talking about having a run swim of those two events. But I was thinking triathlon that night, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to add a bike leg and let the bike leg be the tiebreaker that would show who were the better athletes, the runners or the swimmers? I was pretty much locked in that it had to be just as hard as the marathon or the swim, and no harder. John had the idea that we could have the bike leg be the around the island bike route, which was about 115 miles. And for some reason, I drew the line at 100 miles. I said, that will not work, because I had only done 100 miles on a four mile loop. Now that's boring. And we had had this disagreement for a while. But on February 14th, on Valentine's Day, John made the case that if we took the already established round the island bike route as the bike leg, then we would have three events that were already on the shelf with the permits, with the rules, and most of all, people who were already doing at least two of them. We thought we were the best bicyclists among us. So we also liked the idea that we would have an advantage because we had done some centuries. So that's how we came up with the idea. It was at the Primo Brewery. There, there was beer involved, but not that much. The there, there was a challenge made, but we've looked and looked and tried to find someone who actually heard me say it. As I used to say, I was met with a groundswell of apathy. It was so noisy that night, you couldn't hear yourself think. And here was, there were two really joyous parts. The idea of finishing with the Honolulu Marathon was absolutely titillating. We had spent eight months in the Honolulu Marathon Clinic with that marathon looming ahead of us. And the idea that it would be just one more thing to do after a long day of swimming and biking really was cutting that marathon down to size. And that was a delightful thought. But here was the thing that impressed me and puzzled me. We looked at each other, John and I, and said, if you do it, I'll do it. Then our two friends, Dan Hendrickson and Sid Hendrickson, said, if you do it, I'll do it. Now we had four people who were willing to do this thing. And we would get off the hook for the run swim. We would have a run swim that was an endurance triathlon. 
I looked to the rest of the table, the Waikiki Swim Club Wahinis, my team on this 140 mile relay, and John's team, the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard Yardbirds, and said, anyone else want to do this? And they said, no, but we'll help. And that's when I found out we couldn't have a race without volunteers, without officials, and without sponsors. Our goal was that the run and swim clubs would adopt this event. And we had to keep it simple, make it self-supporting, low cost, so that the clubs would be willing to take it on. Any, any large event, any important event doesn't happen by itself. It is caused by those that happen before it in the chain and it affects those that happen after it in the chain. To get the triathlon where it is today, there are many, many links in the chain. You have already honored many of the other people that were involved in that. If it hadn't been for the uh, Sports Illustrated article, if it hadn't been for Julie Moss's finish, if it hadn't been for the ABC coverage of that, none of this would have happened. So it is an honor to have been one link in that chain, and we thank you for recognizing that.